This is the video podcast for Chapter 8, which addresses the socioeconomic consequences of urbanization impacts on hydrology. And the idea here is that in the previous chapter, Chapter 7, I covered the topic of what are the hydrological and other allied environmental consequences of urbanization. What I want to address here is the fact that when we make those changes to the environment, we expect to get socioeconomic benefits. That's why we're doing it. But in fact, we are also getting some consequences. And what I want to do is look at these feedbacks that we've caused upon ourselves. And you know, you have to decide if these consequences are so severe that we shouldn't be doing that in the first place. Um, or these are just things we either have to mitigate by other measures or just be mindful of. The first thing is to recognize that something like a natural disaster, and from a hydrological perspective, we can think of floods, but you know we could also think of droughts. Um, these are things that the average person tends to view as acts of nature. And this picture here is just really remarkable for how it illustrates that idea. But what I want to show you through this presentation is that, in fact, the things that are happening are not entirely acts of nature. Yes, you can't have a flood if you don't have precipitation, but it takes way more than just precipitation to have a flood. And for, for us to have a socioeconomic consequence, damages or just you know heart, heartbreak, um, it isn't just a result of the precipitation or weather-driven event. So in this video podcast, I'm going to look at what is a flood, both physically and from a management perspective. Why do we have floods? And then how does our culture and societal infrastructure exacerbate the conditions to really create the damages that we experience societally? Of course, throughout the world, natural disasters of all kinds exist. Here's a slide that just shows four in the US, earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, and wildfires. But you could imagine other things, um, you know, severe weather like blizzards could be another example. Uh, nor'easter might be another example. If we look specifically at floods, um, the areas shown in red in this map in the lower left indicate areas where there's four or more presidential flood disaster declarations over this you know, about 50 year period. And you can see that we've got California very well represented, but you know most of the United States has experienced these um, disasters. There's nowhere that, that you know, very few places have zero. I mean, I guess the basin and range area has a, you know, zero, some, some of the southern Wyoming. Um, so there are areas here that are, have lighter um, flood problems, but um, you know, even in an area like Colorado, we just had in 2013 major flooding there that took place. So floods are something that can experience um, throughout the world, and especially in the United States. So what is a flood? Well, the first thing we have to recognize is that a flood is something that occurs hydrologically relative to a river channel. If we look at this map, you see a three-dimensional block that shows a cross-section of the land, including a, a valley a, and a river. And the river is this U-shaped um, channel, like what we could say is a geometric shape like a U, um, that's carved into the bottom of the valley. And all rivers have a geometric shape. They can vary, but they have this geometric shape. Whenever the water spills out of that geometric channel, then we call it a flood. Typically, um, we can define a bank full stage where we're just filling that geometric channel. Um, it may be slightly different in different areas because the river has different shapes, but there is a discharge that we can call the bank full discharge. And it turns out that hydrologists have found that uh, you know, for a standard temperate climate, and maybe a little bit semi-arid, you are gonna have a bankful flow every one to five years. The more arid it gets, the less frequently that happens. But typically, one to five years, you'll reach that stage. So the first thing is, from a physical perspective, a flood is not some unusual thing that happens. It's something that happens every one to five years. So it's really not a big deal from an environmental perspective. Um, this diagram shows other concepts that I'm not going to address right now. The key is really just that the water can spill out of the channel on a fairly regular basis. So what does it mean when we say something like a 100-year flood? 
Now let's ask this question from a societal perspective. When we think about of a flood societally, we're talking about a natural disaster that's causing damages to society. That's usually how we think of it. So as a tax paying citizen, such as you are, if a flood occurs and somebody's house gets damaged or their car gets ruined, for example, you know, I was recently in a situation where my car got flooded out when we had 17.72 inches of rain in 24 hours uh, and I went out of the hotel room and boom, my car is underwater. I uh, wasn't really planning for that. So the question is, should society, meaning you, the taxpayer, cover the damages for all floods, no matter how frequently they occur, where they occur, whose fault it is, you know, should society just step up every single time out of the gate and pay? Well, most people I have polled when I've asked that question would say, no, we're not going to pay every single time something happens. There has to be some personal responsibility, um, you know, to, to take, you know, appropriate precautions. People can go out and buy insurance if they want to. So the question becomes, um, if society wants to provide a safety net that is like a minimum standard to ensure that people don't really suffer badly, um, that's an appropriate goal of government. So what is that safety net? So let me ask you this question. If there's a 10% chance of occurrence of damages, would that be so rare that we should cover that? Is 10% rare enough? I mean, the, um, the higher the percentage is, like 50% chance of, of occurrence, the more money society is going to be spending because it's happening very frequently. So is 10% rare enough that we're providing a good safety net, but you know, not having to spend so much money? How about 1%? How about 0.0001% if you're very stingy? Um, so what you can see is that there's really not a right or wrong answer to this question. There's just what is the level of comfort you know, in a democracy or in a technocracy perhaps or authoritarian regime? What is the level of protection that a government or people is willing to provide? In the United States, the answer is that our society has decided that a 1% chance of damage is the level of protection that we want to provide. So specifically what that means is we're saying, let's look at the areas on land that are likely to experience a flood 1% of the time. And if that's the case, then we want to take precautions to ensure that anything within that zone that's going to flood any more frequently than 1% chance is managed so that we account for that. And by management, that could be building levees, it could be um, building, putting buildings up out of the floodplain, adding a dam. There's a variety of ways of doing that. Um, and it also means that if you're in an area that has a chance of flooding 1% of the time, then society would like to offer you the opportunity to have a safety net. Now, if you're outside of that, so, you know, like you only have a one in, you know, 500, or I shouldn't put it that way, you have a 0.001% chance, you know, that's so rare that society just says, you know what, we're not going to deal with you from this perspective, we're going to have to deal with you in other ways. <clears throat> so when something happens one in a hundred, that's 1%, then if it happens once every hundred, then we like to think of that in hydrology as a hundred year event. It's not really meaning that there's an event that occurs once every 100 years, like you're guaranteed to happen once sometime in 100 years. It just means that in any given year, there's a 1% chance of a flood occurring. So that's the idea of a 100-year flood. Now, how does this play out in terms of day-to-day um, -day lives for people who are like homeowners? Um, when somebody buys a home, typically what they do is they get a 30-year mortgage you know, like a fixed uh, interest rate, 30-year mortgage is like the, the standard for what you do when you buy a home. So if you buy a home and you're in the 100-year flood zone, then essentially what you're doing is gambling. You're saying, you know what, I'm going to live in the flood area because it's a great place to live and, you know, I'm just going to take my chance. And most people are going to discount the likely of a flood and they don't really know. So here's my question to you. If, you. if I were to tell you that there's a 1% chance of a flood happening in any given year, 
what is the odds that over a 30 year period there will be one or more floods during that time? In other words, if we have a 30 year period, what is the chance that flooding is going to happen? It, I don't care if it happens five times, ten times, or just once, but that that there would be flooding of some amount during that hundred year. I mean, sorry, during that thirty year period, because thirty years is the time of a mortgage. So pause here and think about that for a minute, and then and then continue. Okay, so you thought about it for a minute. And maybe you thought, hey, I know, it's 30%, because if there's a 1% chance, then I'm just going to sum that 30 years, because it's 30 years, and I'll get 30%. That's not the way to think about it. So the way you should think about it is provided for you on a worksheet. And you can't see this, but um, I've put this worksheet as a PDF file in SmartSight for students in the class to use. And so what this worksheet does it basically says in any given year there's a one percent chance of having a flood that means that in any given year there's a 99 percent chance of there not being a flood and this is the trick the trick is to calculate what are the odds of not having a flood because if you can do that then whether you have a flood is just one minus the odds of not having a flood so in this case we have a 99 percent chance of not having a flood in any given year, and if we if we want to have ninety nine if we want to have two years with no floods, you first have to have a year with that, and then condition on that you need another year without a flood. So that means you have 0.99, and then 0.99 again, and you're not summing those; it's a multiplication because you're saying I've got 0.99, and then in the second year I'm going to have 0.99 of 0.99. And then in the third year, it's like, I'm going to have 0.99 of 0.99 of 0.999. And so, uh, 0.99. So what that means is that we're going to 0.99 raised to the nth power, where n is the number of years of interest. So if you pause and take your calculator and do 0.99 raised to the 30th, see what you get. Then do 1 minus that value, and that will be the odds of having a flood. Because 0.99 to the end were the odds of not having a flood. And when you do that, you'll find that in a 30-year period, the odds are that there's a 26% chance that you will have a flood. So if you live in the 100-year floodplain, you buy that house, Essentially what you're doing is you're saying over the course that you raise your children and they're happy and do all the things you're going to do and maybe you're not going to have children. But whatever it is that you do over the course of that mortgage, you're saying that you can live with a 26% chance, essentially one in four chance that, you're, um, that you might flood. Um, now, of course, if I was going to go gamble in a casino and I have a 75% chance of winning, I'm gonna take that bet every day because you're gonna win a lot of money. Casinos make their money with a 51% chance or even you know 50.001 with the volume of people gambling. So a 75% chance, it isn't bad. However, when you look at the country as a whole, the odds of that happening anywhere in the country are high and that means that the country is gonna be paying a fair amount. So it turns out that a 1% chance safety net governing this 100-year flood idea is actually a pretty significant uh, safety net that in, entails a lot of payout. And in fact, the country has been paying out so much money that it's in the process right now of dramatically changing the rates for, for um, flood insurance. And the idea of flood insurance is just that if you live in this zone, um, the country wants to provide you a safety net, but it's not going to give you a 100% free ride. It's saying that if you're in this zone, you've got to pay something, and that's called flood insurance. And you know, depending on where you are, flood insurance could be $300 or $3,000 a year. And, um, and in return, they might reimburse, say, up to $250,000 or something like that if there's a flood. So it's important to recognize that you know, the government is giving you something. It's a safety net. But it's not going to reimburse you for the fact that your Xbox got ruined or something like that. There's only so much you're going to get. Okay, so let's look at a chain of logic here to try to understand what are the risks of flooding and what are the consequences in terms of economic dollars. Well, during the 20th century, floods were the number one natural disaster in terms of the number of lives lost and property damage. But that is changing now in the 21st 
um, century as other disasters are starting to take a greater toll. But this map just shows that, you know, floods occur widely over the U.S., like I showed before. And, you know, here are some of the top events that have, that have happened. So you can look at that on your own. Now, I was curious to say, is weather changing? You know, are floods actually getting worse through time? And so just to look here where we live in California, I took um, the rainfall in Davis, California, and unfortunately there's a gap in the record, but <clears throat> taking about 100 years worth of rainfall data, and I looked at what is the peak daily value of precipitation in a given year. So have, has, have, have the worst storms in every year gotten worse? And what you can see is no, that there, there's a lot of variability to rainfall in California, especially Davis. <coughs> and in fact, there's really no trend here at all. So there's no indication that the weather itself has gotten worse for us. Now let's look at a river in California that's relatively naturalized. Uh, if we look at the Cosumnes River at Michigan Bar, it's coming out of the Sierra Mountains. There's no major dam or water supply facility in there. It's one of the lightly, light, lightest regulated rivers in the Sierras. And what you can see here, if I look at the peak daily discharge in a given year, um, then what you can see is that similarly, there's a lot of range to what those values are, but on average, as you look through time, there's really no trend. I mean, there's a slight flutter after 1960, but it's definitely not enough. It's totally insignificant from a statistical perspective. Um, and this is bringing the data up, up to present. So the important thing that you can get from this is that, you know, at the scale of sizable rivers where people live, there's no obvious increase like due to climate change or anything else. There's no trend. So the hazard of floods, like the physical occurrence of floods, has not gotten worse. However, societal factors have made floods worse over time. And this is something that I've already covered uh, twice. So when we looked at the effect of humans on deforestation, or deforestation effects on flows, I showed you that areas um, with, let's see, with or without deforestation, the sensitivity there is higher for small events than large events. And I also showed a similar phenomenon of the effects um, in, in the last lecture on urbanization. So what this graph shows, it's relatively complicated to piece out. So on the x-axis is a flood recurrence interval. So something that reoccurs a lot, like 10 times a year, is what's shown on the left. Once every 0.1 years is the same as 10 times a year. That's a very frequent event, which means it's small. Um, a flood that occurs once a year, a flood that occurs once every 10 years, 100 years, or 200 years. So as you go to the right, you're going to less frequent, more extreme, you know, bigger floods. On the y-axis is the percent of the basin paved. So this is the urbanization effect, not the forestation effect. And then the weird thing here is, for now, just look at these lines. These lines are contour lines. Forget the individual dots and individual numbers. The lines go for 20, you know, 15, 10, 4, 3, you know, 2, and 1. So what you can see is that um, for a flood recurrence interval um, of say, uh, and this is a, could be a log scale, but um, it is a log scale. Um, as you go from, let's say, a value of like, you know, I don't know, you know, 0.1, paving even 7% of the basin yields 20 times more water than it is without it. So actually, that's what I forgot to tell you. The numbers on these lines indicate the ratio of the peak discharge after urbanization compared to the peak discharge before. So let's look at a one-year event. If I go one-year event and I go up to this line, we can see that if I pay the basin 20%, then a flood magnitude that occurs once a year, relatively small, but it's going to be 10 times bigger after urbanization than before. Now, if we go out to a 100-year event, and even if I pave, say, you know, 45% of the watershed, uh, I'm only going to have double the amount of flow. So you can see that the, the effect of humans is bigger, disproportionately bigger for small events than it is for large events. But across all events, um, you know, other than these most extreme events for the lightest amount of paving, um, we're going to have you know, one and a half to 20 times more water in the peak, which is the peak is when water floods out of the channel and it's spilling all over, you know, the, the, the biggest extent of flooding. 
um, we're going to have substantially more water after urbanization than before. So the point here again is it doesn't matter how much rain you get. If you change the land, you can dramatically change the possibility of a flood. And the reason that happens is that, um, that you're not allowing water to spill out. Well, first of all, right, so this is, a, this is the paving effect. So basically changing the hydrological balance to produce more water, as I talked about last in, in chapter seven, but then also um, changing the channel infrastructure as well. So what this graph shows that uh, through time from 1934 to 2000, there has been a range in damages, but if you look at the trend, which is shown in the line, um, the flood damages as a function, if we normalize everything on a 1995 dollar basis, the amount of damages caused by floods has been trending upward. Okay, so you know, before 1960, there would be about $1 billion per year in damage but you know, um, you know, since say 1990, an average would be more like four billion dollars a year in flood damages. And of course, like 1993 was the the big Mississippi River basin flood, and that caused, uh, you know, according to this graph, something like 17 billion dollars. And that's a rainfall-driven flood. Um, this is Hurricane Agnes here in 1972, I believe. Okay, so. You see the juxtaposition I'm getting at here is that the weather hasn't changed, um, flows haven't changed naturally, but because people have changed the hydrology of the land and they've changed the channels, they've dramatically increased the risk of flooding. And so we're seeing then flood damages go up. So the same storms, but more humans doing all kinds of crazy things yield more flood damages. Okay. Now I want to go a little bit further with this analysis. So what I did is I took another graph that looked at the same kind of data and it looks at the natural disasters on a four year you know, average basis. Um, and so what you can see here is that over, over four years we have a total of um, you know, about $11 billion worth of damage of which the majority was hurricanes but that's usually flood induced anyway. Um, and so you can see that you know, in the 1950s to 1980s, we'd have about um, you know, 10 billion to 12 billion dollars a year divided by, um, divided by four years. So something like two to three billion dollars a year. And on the previous slide, you see the same kind of thing. You know, but in the 1990s, we have about three to four billion dollars per year in damages. So that gives you an idea of that. Now, if you look at crime, I went into the FBI crime loss reports from the 1995 to 2005, and you can see that for financial related crimes shown here, um, we have uh, typically 15 to 18 billion dollars a year. So according to this, there is, there, in, in the 90s anyway, there was more damage, uh, proper, I mean, you know, financial damage by crime than by natural disasters. Um, however, that has dramatically changed since the 1993 flood. And you can see here that in addition to the flood, which is just that part of it, when you tack on hurricanes, then we're now up to $100 billion. And so I've looked at this a little bit further. If we, this is a graph that shows the um, damages associated with billion dollar weather disasters from 1980 to 2012. And if you focus on the red line, and the, the, on the graph here is the cost in billions of dollars. And notice the scale here, zero to $180 billion per year. So you could see here, for example, that you know, uh, if we follow the red line, it does vary, but you know, typically the, the baseline here is around 10 to 20 billions of dollars with spikes of you know, 40 to 80 billions of dollars. And then of course, Hurricane Katrina, which may be incalculable, but estimated here at about $180 billion. So this is now adding up all weather events, so it's going beyond floods, and there's no question that comparatively, if you look at natural, well, so-called natural disasters versus crime damages, um, the losses, the financial losses associated with natural disasters beats the financial losses associated with crimes. In terms of loss of life, though, um, there's no question that crime causes way more damage in terms of loss of life than natural disasters do. So in that sense, um, the ability to forecast natural disasters has really changed the calculus um, on that aspect. 
Um, and so we can't account for that here, and it's important to appreciate that crime certainly is an important problem. But, you know, every time there's an election, politicians are, have their feet held to the fire for what are they going to do about crime. Now, crime has gone down dramatically in America in the last 15 years, but um, there's a, a lot of reasons that go into that. But in the meantime, um, disproportionately, dramatically more resources are spent in America on crime compared to, to, to natural disasters. And this shows the total flood control expenditures from 1928 to 2000 was $122 billion. Yet despite all those investments, of course, flood damages continue to increase. So it just goes to show, like, it's been a drop in the bucket. We've hardly tackled the problem of the cost of natural disasters um, you know, compared to the amount of money that's been put into fighting crime. So it's just helpful to think about different ways that society spends money and how we think of these disasters, and we even call them natural disasters, when in fact I've shown you from a hydrological perspective, the impact of urbanization increases the peak of, the, of a flood from 2 to 20 times. <clears throat> Here's another example. This just shows a map of the U.S., in 2011, and you know there's a flooding of two billion dollars there and four billion dollars here, so six billion dollars of flood damages, but other natural disasters contributing you know tens of million billions of dollars more. So let's try to understand how this actually happens in our society. I mean, you can understand the hydrological processes that I mentioned in in the last lecture, but let's look at this. So everything really begins with population, and of course the population in the United States and in California, while there's still lots of empty land and we don't have a very high population density, the population has been increasing, and of course we've passed 300 million people living in the United States, that's documented. Um, this map shows the growth of Sacramento from 1990 to 2000, and what you can see is that um, that that the city has been growing primarily along its fringes, this area down in the south towards Elk Grove, and then the area here in the north, um, probably like a Roseville sort of area. And so, you know, population growth drives demand for land because people need homes and businesses and so forth, and schools and, you know, parks. And so land gets developed. So the first thing that has to happen is that developers propose to build. This is step one. So you can take an area like the Natomas Basin off of the Sacramento River and you can say, hey, here's a big tract of land that we could use. Step two is we could take advantage of the fact that FEMA has already developed a flood floodplain risk map. And so if we look at this um, dash area here is the area of, of like Natomas. Um, bounded by this small, thin, you know, teal-colored um, area, which is the Sacramento River, with the Yolo Bypass over to the left, and then within the dash line, within the the bypass, the colors are keyed according to the right. So the light blue area are areas that during a hundred-year flood would be under one to five feet, orange nine to thirteen feet, and then the pink down here, thirteen to fifteen feet. So you start off with saying, hey, this is a great place to build. No one's living there. And then you say, oh my gosh, it's a hole in the ground. And it's a hole that's going to fill with up to 15 feet of water when it floods. But hey, what happens is <clears throat> we're going to build there anyway. I mean, you know, people want a place to live. There's too much pressure. It's too convenient. So something's going to happen. So the next step in the development process is you've got to change the flood map. And there's two ways to do that. One way get the water out of there by building a levee. And this is just a fantastic photo. I, I can't remember where I got it from. It was, it was out of a, a, um, the news, I think, on, on the internet. But what you can see is a really beautifully engineered levee here uh, on one side protecting this community. And then the community right next to it doesn't have a levee and it's totally flooded out. So this is the story of the three little pigs all over again. But basically, you've got to pay a lot of money and hopefully, you know, you figure, well, the federal government is good for a good fraction of it. Maybe the state government is good. Maybe your local flood district is good. And so these got to get built. There is another way, though. So this is pretty interesting. Is you could always say, you know what, FEMA? I don't believe your map. Your map, just stuff it. It's no good. I'm going to go out and I'm going to hire the students in HYD 143 when they're 
uh, in their careers at some HYD consulting firm. And they're going to redo these calculations, and we're going to tweak some parameters, and we're going to get ourselves out of that floodplain. And so if you can put together a reasonable analysis that you know is logical but just comes up with a different answer, you can challenge those calculations and get yourself out of the floodplain. So it says right here, FEMA relies heavily on communities to provide notification of changing flood hazard information. So you can change the map by not doing anything wrong, just say that they're wrong. After all, they're making their best guess, so why can't you take a stab at making your own? So once you've either got the water out of the hole or said the hole isn't a hole, then you sell homes. And of course, most of the time when people sell homes, they don't mention to their customers that there are floods. More recently, there are laws, depending on where you live, that require notification of you know, f agricultural smells and uh, fires and floods and so forth. However, you know, uh, what may happen is that could just be an individual piece of paper that you have to look at, maybe you have to initial it, but you know, you get a hundred pieces of paper or a thousand pieces of paper when you buy a home. Um, if they don't make a big deal out of it and you don't know or care and it's a, you know, it's a beautiful day on the day you're buying the home, it's not going to really make much difference. Now, in some cases, they're actually even giving you a CD, which has more information, or I'm sorry, a DVD, but who's going to like play that video and really figure it out? And what you can see here is that the way these homes are advertised is just what you'd expect. Beautiful homes in wonderful neighborhoods with white picket fences and all kinds of recreational opportunities. Your kids are going to be safe and happy and grow, and everything's going to be wonderful. So you're know, really promoting all those positives. Another thing that happens is that we see that um, businesses really like to develop in the urban core right along rivers. And this is a little aerial view um, of the Guadalupe River where the Adobe Corporation headquarters is located right on the river. So it's hard to even see, but the river is located right here. Um, here is the Adobe headquarters right in the middle. And that looks like a little tiny podunk river. I mean, my God, you can barely see it for the size of the superhighway over it. But look at this headline from 1958. Palo Altans flee rising waters. Creek's top bank pose San Jose threat. The Guadalupe River, a wild brown torrent, battered at bridges in downtown San Jose and spilled into the streets at some points. So there's no question rivers do flood. Doesn't matter what you do. And so, um, you know, we just have to be mindful of that and you know, try to manage it. One thing that a geologist will tell you is no matter how good you build a levee, eventually it can spill over it. I mean, remember, it's a 100-year levee, right? It's designed to protect us from the 1% event. But what happens if, if uh, the events change? You know, the levees could be sinking a little bit. The levees can be undermined. Uh, or you just have a bigger rainstorm, you know? I mean, and just get a bigger storm. Uh, or the conditions in the watershed change upstream. More land use means more water with higher peaks, so it could overtop those levees and break them. Um, this slide shows you some of the ways in which levees can fail from erosion, seepage, sinking islands, um, you know, damage to the crowns, or they can just be overtopped. So, you know, we try to take reasonable precautions, but when your flood is damaged from an event, nothing seems reasonable anymore. They should have done more. And then that leads to the lesson. Society reflects on what happened, and I'm not gonna go through all these, so you can just pause the slide or look in the PDF file and read these for yourself. Um, these are lessons that came from the 1993 flood. Despite learning these lessons, we still have floods all the time. We still have all kinds of problems, so lessons get learned and forgotten and learned and forgotten, and that's the cycle of uh, how this goes. And then inevitably, People as a society are so closely tied to their land, their property, it's really important to them. And so when something happens, it's human nature to say, you know what, I'm going to fight back. I'm going to spring out of this. You're not going to beat me down. They almost see it as like a personal affront, like a challenge. And so then you just re rebuild the same way and repeat. 
Now, it's been very interesting. Things really changed after the 1993 floods in the Mississippi River. And things have also been changing along the coast. You think of like North Carolina, where they've had very progressive policies of trying to buy out lands along the coast to um, wet, when there's coastal damage to get people out of the way of that. So things are changing. People aren't necessarily rebuilding the same way in the same places, but there's still an awful lot of that. I mean, it just comes down to cost. Um, which is why things get built the way they do and the way that we calculate risk in our minds. There are examples of other ways of dealing with floods and there's a really important example in history from the South Platte River north of Littleton, Colorado. Um, this is not too far from South Park of, you know, South Park, Colorado infamy. Um, but as it says here, you know, the plan was simple but revolutionary. Um, the Corps of Engineers wanted to protect Littleton by building a dam. They decided that they didn't want to do it that way. Instead, what they wanted to do was use the same amount of money to buy out undeveloped proportions of the floodplain. What happened is that the Corps of Engineers wasn't going to allow them to do that because Congress hadn't authorized them to, to take alternative approaches to flood management. So the people of Littleton went to Washington and passed a law, the Water Resources Development Act, and that authorized federal participation with local interests to do alternative floodplain strategies. And this photo is from today. And what you can see is that, you know, it doesn't mean you can't have anything in the vicinity of the river, but there is a 625 acre riparian reserve you know, known as the South Platte Park that fronts the river. So you can set aside land, give the river buffer, allow it to flood out into, into a reasonable amount of area. Again, it still doesn't mean you can't have a massive flood bigger than that or have other kinds of problems arise, um, but it's all about finding ways of addressing problems cumulatively with different tools. So the other things that you could do are technical solutions like uh, rainfall infiltration strips and flow detention ponds. And I'll talk uh, in the next chapter about other you know, little urban things that we can do at the house level. Um, you can expand the natural floodway like they did in, uh, in Littleton. And of course, here in California on the Feather, Bear, Yuba, the Three Rivers Levee Project, where they've set back the levees to give the river some more room. You can also do planning to you know, try to only you know, direct growth with economic incentives into areas that are less prone to damage. You can buy things out. And you can you know, elevate buildings, get them up higher, um, or, or flood-proof them so they don't get damaged when they get wet. Looking beyond floods, because so far all this socioeconomic consequence of hydrologic alteration has just been on floods, but there are also problems with water quality and other things. So we can think of what we could call externalities of the development of urbanization. <clears throat> For example, um, you know, if you, if you have a public health crisis like G a Giardia outbreak or cryptosporidium outbreak, what happens? Well, all of a sudden you have to operate in crisis mode and that means people are working overtime and you know crisis resources have to be deployed and managing crises is always way more expensive than preventative maintenance of problems in the in, in out front. In addition to that, when people get sick from water quality problems, they have to take time off work to get medical treatment. Um, we, we had an example recently where we had a spill, you know, and you have a spill, um, there, there was a massive spill a few years ago in TV, Tennessee Valley Authority, I think there was a huge spill there, there was a recent spill in West Virginia, you know, whenever something happens that you have this water quality, all of a sudden people are realizing that there was this infrastructure that they were taking for granted and depending on. You can't just live on bottled water. I mean, you know, you, you, we use massive amounts of water in the United States. And then there's also the social impact of when people don't trust the water supply anymore. Why do we spend $1.25 for a small little bottle of water? I mean, it's, it's really crazy. You can go to the tap and get perfectly safe and, you know, good tasting water. But, you know, many times people are buying it um, out of their own pocket at a very exorbitant cost. And of course, with the, the harm to the environment from the production of, of the bottles or you know, flying water from Fiji to California because we need to drink Fiji water. So you can see that there are social and economic consequences um, when we have negative hydrological impacts as a result of urbanization. 
And finally, there are social, um, there can be social costs, and we really saw this in the 70s and early 80s. Um, today, more than 25 million Americans are using water in terms of non-contact activities like rafting and canoeing with you know, minor contact but not swimming. People spend a lot of money on equipment and services. Um, the Pacific Northwest rafting industry generates more than $300 million. So, you know, anytime you're degrading the system with acid mine drainage um, or, you know, pollution releases or any of these kinds of problems, then you're hitting, hurting the economy associated with that. Um, same thing with fishing. You know, like as we have degraded estuaries like Chesapeake Bay and San Francisco Bay, then um, angling has been significantly hurt. And then, of course, there's the reality that we value nature in and of itself. And so if people value things, then that is an economic and social factor that we also try to protect as a society. So overall, the thesis here has been that we alter the land to create conditions that are appropriate for human growth and development of our civilization to continue on that trajectory that we're on. However, in doing so, we're causing a wide range of, you know, of impacts to the environment from hydrology, hydraulics, water quality, ecology. And then those changes in turn come back and bite us in the back in terms of these kinds of socioeconomic impacts of increased damages from a variety of natural disasters, but especially floods um, and impacts in water quality and um, our ability to recreate and enjoy the environment.